effective. That's where the yield was around there on September 12th. That's the day before the Federal Reserve announced its latest round of quantitative easing. So essentially what we've seen happen is that after the quantitative easing was announced, we saw actually some selling in Treasuries, yields pushing back up, people getting a little bit more optimistic that perhaps the Fed's plan would work potentially. But now that's come back down in part because of some of the economic data that we've gotten this week. We had New York manufacturing falling to a three-year low in September. The Philly showing contraction. So all of that uh, still casting a bit of an economic pall. That means people were buying treasuries again. And we saw the yields go down to that one and three quarters percent level once again, Trish. All righty. Thank you so much, Julie. And to the rest of the gang, we want to head straight to the pits for the rest of this market roundup. Keith Bliss at the New York Stock Exchange. Larry Shover in Chicago. And our closer, Jay Pulaski, is still with us. Good to see all you guys. Keith, starting there with you. I mean, this is sort of the week after, or the, the week that was here uh, after QE3. Um, your take on on the market's reaction to this and this 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 knowing now that we're just going to continue to get the Fed to print money until we actually start to see some kind of turnaround. Yeah, so uh, so what we're starting to see here is ever so slight change, and it'll probably pick up speed as we go through the weeks, but it, it, it appears what we saw this week is that people are actually starting to think about trading the market on fundamentals again as opposed to uh, any, any central bank action. We're still going to have the central bank overhang, and it looks like that's going to be an indefinite uh, thing that we're going to have to deal with, which could keep the markets frothy. But um, we didn't have the immediate run-up, and people are actually starting to talk about what is going to be the efficacy of this QE forever uh, mm -hmm. policy that we're now getting out of the Fed, and we'll have to see what uh, Japan and the and the People's Bank of China do long term. But that's that's clearly what we're starting to see. And okay. the economic the economic data this week was not good. No, not good. And yet I would argue, Larry, that the market sort of held up remarkably well in the face of everything. It seemed as though it investors really were trying to fight back and they couldn't because this market was just resilient in the face of so much badness. Yeah, you couldn't have said it better. And, I, and I'm one of those traders and investors who's trying to fight it. I mean, think of all the moving parts this week. We have China down 4.5%. We have oil grains VIX all falling off a cliff. We have an apple frenzy. And we have a Fed that wants to create inflation at any cost. And we just can't, at the end of the day, underestimate the tailwind that that's going to produce. And though this has been a very confusing week, but at the end of the day, our stock market continues to grind higher for better or for worse. Yeah, it certainly does. Hey, uh, uh, Keith Bliss, I saw you earlier today down on Stone Street. We did the noonday show, Lunch Money, took it outside. You were all smiles, but uh, as were a lot of traders out there. But there's something that kind of mystifies me, and maybe you can shed a little light on it. The week after QE3, the three worst performing groups in the S&P, financials, energy, and materials, shouldn't they be up after QE3? Well, again, and, and that's what Larry was just talking about. I mean, the, the oddity of this market, down is the new up, up is the new down. It's very hard to decipher which way investors want to go. Uh, fundamentally speaking, as we were just saying, the news is not good, and that's why I think you're seeing uh, financials and energy uh, come down a little bit. So are we going to have that sea change back to trading on fundamentals? We'll still need a couple of more weeks to tell. The other thing that I'll caution people on, though, is that remember that this is the quarter end that we're going to be getting in next week, and I dare say, particularly with the news that we saw that this was the biggest month for outflows out of the hedge funds in September, I dare say we're probably going to see a little bit of window dressing next week. So I wouldn't be too confident that this is going to be a good market to start shorting on based on the fundamentals, and we go down from here. Jake Wolosky, your take on that? I mean, you, yeah. do you think that, that the fundamentals are going to look differently than, than I think, we hear suggested? Well, I want to get Jay here into the well, panel. Well, recap. Trish, I, I think that it plays to what we talked about at the outset, what comes next. And I think we are through all this big macro news, and I think the, the focus is going to shift to the fundamentals, and I think it's going to be very much earnings-driven and economic data-driven. And my, my, the way I'm setting up for it is that I think these regional slowdowns are morphing into a global slowdown. And I think there's a real risk of a recession in the U.S. next year. Hey, when you say regional slowdowns, clarify, regions within the U.S. or regions globally? Regions globally. So the U.S. is clearly slowing. You have the fiscal cliff. We, talk, we talked about complacency earlier. Policymakers have no pressure to do anything. Congress went on vacation and went on recess. No fiscal cliff action. In Europe, they're saying now now that unless uh, countries are in really diff deep difficulty, they're not going to go for the ESM. In, in, in China, as we touched on, 
you have a situation where the, the country and the political class have a real tough time putting it together. So, so this all leads you to believe that this market at this point has, has pretty much uh, become rather overpriced with the 16 percent gain so far this year? Well, I, I think it's definitely been overbought. I think valuations are not really compelling. And I think earnings growth expectations for Q4, particularly for technology, is very high. And for 2013, overall, the market is quite high. And I remind everyone that what the Fed is buying is not stocks. They're buying bonds. So if you want to be protected, you go where you know there's a buyer and that's in the fixed income market not necessarily treasuries I don't think that's really all that attractive but spread product high yield in the US emerging market dollar denominated debt I think remain attractive so Jay obviously you're making the, the case for uh, markets having some headwinds as you get into year-end but we got quarter end coming up over the next couple of weeks so let me ask our two traders uh, Keith and Larry uh, Keith will start with you and then Larry uh, jump in and answer is it possible that we get a sort of into the uh, quarter uh, markup and also some of this retail money that seems to to be flowing into the market. Can we get some sort of pop over the next couple of weeks? And then after that point, you actually want to start to uh, lighten it up? Yeah, I, I absolutely think that's the case. I mean, some of the models that we look at that are quantitatively driven, driven, there's enough momentum in the marketplace. And then when you factor in what we do generally see at the end of the quarter, which is window dressing, I see no reason why this market couldn't trade a little bit higher. And then we start reevaluating things on the fundamentals in October. Larry? Yeah, you know, right now, I think fundamentals and convention just have to go out the window. I mean, I think the entire market is overvalued. I wouldn't necessarily be in it, but on the short term, there is a wild beta chase going on. I could see the S&Ps easily going up to 1475, 1495 area before we see a correction because the tailwind of the Fed is so enormous. We just can't deny that. Yeah, fact. I mean, and Jay, back over to you for a moment. I mean, as long as the Fed says they're going to keep printing, shouldn't that bode well for equities? I, I hear you on the fundamentals, and I, I, I do worry about a stock market that has become completely divorced from the fundamental reality of the economy. Um, but, you know, if you're going to be in to, to win it in the near term, don't you want to be on board. Well, I think there is tremendous performance pressure amongst the professional investor class, no doubt about it. Almost, you know, underperforming by a wide margin. Now, whether you play that for a couple weeks, this is the big dichotomy that people are wrestling with. I don't, I, I think spread product is a way to play in between. You get your yield, you get some capital appreciation potential, you don't take the risk of earnings disappointments, okay. and you're not buying a one, one and a half or 1.7 percent treasury yield. <laughs> Yeah, because that's not going to be very far. Yeah, you're buying 6 or 7%, and if you get a little bit of capital appreciation, you can eke out a 12%, 10% annual return, which I think is, is pretty decent. Okay. Thanks so much to the whole gang. We've got Keith in New York, Larry in Chicago, Jay sticking with us. All right, that's your close, everyone, but we have your first trade for Monday. Here's a look at what's coming up next on Street Smart. <laughs>